Hello, everybody. My name is Jana Rodriguez, and I'm from Stanford University. And today, I'm going to be talking about direct measurements of anchor damping. And as you can see, uh, those are the list of micro outdoors. So I'm not really going to talk about uh, all the details about Q because uh, Professor Steve Shaw already gave us a really good introduction about what it is Q and how we measure it. But the most important thing about Q is that uh, for resonators, um, oscillators, inertia sensors, we really care about having a really high quality factor. And in order to have a high, a high quality factor, then we really need to understand the different dissipation mechanisms that actually dissipate the quality factor. And on that way, we can increase the quality factor. So in order to quantify the quality factor, as we can see, is the sum of the different dissipation mechanisms. We have, I had listed the most popular ones uh, or the ones that they are the most important usually, which is um, gas damping, thermoelastic dissipation, a key star effect, surface, and anchor damping. And the ones that they are critical for most MEMS resonators are actually gas damping, thermoelastic dissipation, and anchor damping. We have really good models to actually predict gas damping and thermoelastic dissipation but today, we really don't have good models to be able to predict and understand anchor damping. And that's the critical part of our work. So in order to really understand anchor damping, this is what we did. First, we used this classic resonator, uh, double ending tuning fork. And we use this specific resonator because we understand how it behaves. We have plenty of different resonators. We have been building these resonators for years. Um, it has low gas damping, and also it is really easy to uh, see how it behaves. So I'm going to, in order to really isolate anchor damping, you first, what you need to do is to reduce the other two or eliminate the other two dissipation mechanisms. So the first thing that we did is that we eliminated gas damping. And the way that we eliminated gas damping was that we have our original resonators and then we measure the Q as the resonators are encapsulated. Then we drill a hole using a focal ion beam and we break the encapsulation and then we let air in. And after that, we put the resonator inside a pressure chamber and then we do a pressure sweep. On this pressure sweep, we can see if uh, gas damping actually influenced the performance of this resonator. And our, our experiments are actually done at ultra vacuum. So we are way uh, below what it is needed to be considered uh, uh, needed. So the gas damping effect doesn't actually play an effect on our resonator. So uh, gas damping gets eliminated. So now we are going to move about the second uh, dissipation mechanism, which is thermoelastic dissipation. Thermoelastic dissipation is uh, the coupling between a strain and temperature. And what it is, is when the beam is moving, um, is becoming, um, is oscillating, and it comes, um, it creates tension and compression zones, and these tension and compression zones actually create a heat flux. And this heat flux is the loss of energy and is irreplaceable energy. And we are able to model the thermoelastic dissipation if we have the right parameters. And one of the key parameters to model this is the coefficient of thermal expansion. And uh, is represented on alpha on this equation. And the coefficient of thermal expansion uh, there is one specific critical point here. Uh, when the CTE goes to zero, actually, even though when the resonator is still vibrating up and down, there is no energy loss just at this specific point. So for silicon uh, resonators, the coefficient of thermal expansion goes from positive to negative at low temperature. And this coefficient of thermal expansion can be eliminated at two different zones. For our specific case, 
we are going to try to focus on eliminating the coefficient of thermal expansion at negative 150 C. And this is critical because we are going to use this as a base for our work. So what that means is that at that specific point, at negative 150 Celsius, the CTE becomes zero. So at this point that we know that we do not have any gas damping, and we also know that we don't have any TED if we are uh, passing the, the negative 150 Celsius mark. So how did we do this? So in order to do this, we built up a pressure chamber and Uh, well, apparently my video is not playing either, uh, but I will just verbally explain what happened. So what happens is that um, in the pressure chamber, what we do is that we have a vacuum. We put a resonator inside a vacuum. We call a resonator way below negative 150. As you can see, we start, uh, we go even to negative 180 Celsius. And then we are calling this resonator using heat conduction. And once the resonator uh, gets passing the, this point, this critical point, then as we are doing and taking this, all this uh, data, we are doing rain down measurements, which um, as Professor um, Shaw just explained, those are critical to being able to actually take the measurements quick enough and accurate enough to be able to really capture the entire ring down of the resonators. And these are the results from taking those measurements. So the first, uh, the first graph, or I mean the first, the asterisk indicate the measure data. We start at room temperature and we go all the way to negative 182 Celsius. And then we assume that the highest point from that measurement is actually Q anchor. And that's Q anchor because at that point, the CT goes to zero, so we don't have any thermoelastic dissipation. We don't have any gas damping. So the only thing that we have left is actually anchor damping. And for this specific resonator, which is the double ending tuning fork, if we consider that that point of anchor damping um, is actually the same, or in other words, if we consider that anchor damping is not temperature dependent, then uh, we can use that one and combine them with the blue line. The blue line is actually an independent model uh, of TD. So now we have an independent model of TD. We have uh, the Q anchor, and if we combine them together, we get the green line. And the green line is pretty similar or almost matches what it is the measure data. So this is pretty good because this led us to believe that using these specific uh, experiments, then we can model uh, a combination of TED and ankle damping to be able to get the actual data from our resonators. However, as we are performing these experiments, uh, we are seeing um, that some changes in our measurements. So then we decided to have two different experiments. The first one was to have our die mounted to the package, package using a specific thermal paste. And the second experiment was to have our die just uh, connected to our package using some wires. And we call it this experiment just floating. Now, uh, this, this is exactly the same resonator. We haven't changed the resonator, therefore we haven't changed the anchor. And the question here is that uh, would mounting the resonator in these two different configurations will change our Q anchor? Well, to answer this question, we perform a series of experiments. And for the first set of experiments, this is what we found. We found that we attached the die, we glue it to the package, and then we took a set of experiment, and then we got a Q anchor. And then we removed the die, exactly the same die, and then we reattach it again with uh, applying the same thermal paste, and we took a second set, and so on and so forth. And what happened is that Q anchor, as you can see, it changes. 
every time that uh, we repeated the same experiment. So uh, these early measurements led us to believe that actually the mounting on the resonator has to do with how Q anchor changes. Moreover, when we move from that and actually test it just using what we call the flooding testing, what happens here is that uh, when you don't have this paste, now you get the same Q anchor over and over again. So it's highly repeatable. And as you can see, uh, it's way higher than actually when you are using the thermal paste. Moreover, just to be extra sure about these experiments, uh, we tested again with a different thermal paste. And then mainly we discovered three things from this experiment. The first thing is that is clearly that you can see that the Q anchor changes depending on how you are mounting your resonator. The second thing that you can see is that the anchor itself hasn't been changed. The only thing that it has been changed is how we are mounting the resonator. So this leave us, led us to believe that how we are modeling our current anchor, uh, which is usually just around the anchor itself of the resonator, can lead us to an incorrect Q anchor dissipation since now the energy is, we know that it is escaping uh, somehow from the resonator, but it can be either kept inside the die itself if we don't have an extra path below the die for the energy to be escaping. And the last one um, is that this led us to do further experiments to really understand Q anchor and how the energy gets dissipated in our resonators. So in the future, what we are doing is we are changing the number of wires, the number of anchors, and the number of dopings for our resonators. So in conclusion, we reported and we were able to take for the first time the measurements of anchor damping and experimentally show that. Um, and also we confirmed that the mounting or the way that you are mounting your die to your package has an influence on the overall quality factor. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I will take them.